Hello and welcome to the show. Now, you know, over the last couple of months, uh, perhaps a year, I'm not sure, Professor Tim Noakes was on the show, and ever since that day, I've been bombarded with questions which I cannot answer. So the next step was to invite him back, uh, catch up again with him. There's been some issues uh, going on in his life with regards to the hearings and stuff like that. People are asking those questions. Uh, they're asking more and more questions, and I think that's all good. Uh, but let's find out how that's been going with him. Professor, welcome. Thank you so much. Privileged to be here. Thank you, yeah. Faisal. It's been a while since you've been there, and uh, we sort of left you uh, because we knew things were happening and a lot of things were happening in your life uh, that perhaps uh, promoted your diet, in my <laughs> view. Um, and um, uh, they say that there's no such thing as bad publicity. Uh, so um, it's all good in the end of the day. So we're hoping that that's what's happened on your side. Well, I think so, yes. Uh, you know, we, we, the problem for the opposition was that they accused me of giving unconventional advice. And then that opened up the question of what is conventional advice? and what is the unconventional advice. And after 10 days, I finally got onto the stand and I spoke for five and a half days. Five and a half days. Five and a half days, 900 slides, and about 35 hours of testimony. Okay, okay, can we put that into our 25 minutes? <laughs> because it's quite a bit that needs to go on there. Absolutely, well, I covered at least 10 different topics. And at the end of the day, I felt, well, I finally set down in stone the low carbohydrate arguments. And the fact that there is utterly no evidence, there's no scientific basis for the prescription of this high carbohydrate diet, which begins in 1977. Yes. And since I've, we discussed it a year ago, there are two major publications which have come out to show that there was no evidence. We should never have changed in 1977. And that is the cause of our ill health now, is because there was no scientific basis for the, what, the diet that we're prescribing for all our patients. That's interesting. I'll remember that date because it was the year that I was born. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to remember that one. Professor, it's been a long road for you. Um, and I, I think that people have now started understanding um, the diet. Uh, they're understanding uh, the issues around diabetes and predisposed, being predisposed to diabetes and, and all those things. And people, they've been watching the YouTube clips. They've been following what's going on in the papers. Um, I have certain questions around all of that. So. Just, but before we get there, let's just talk about the diet for one minute. Can we just rehash what the diet's about again? What, what's the key principles? So for those that have not caught up with that, they, are, they do understand. So the key principle is that many of us have a condition called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is the substrate for all the chronic diseases that we currently express. Diabetes, obesity, heart disease, perhaps cancer, and perhaps dementia they're actually symptoms of an underlying problem, which is insulin resistance. Now, if you're insulin resistant, it's fine as long as you don't eat too much carbohydrate. But carbohydrates then converts insulin resistance into hypertension, diabetes, obesity, perhaps cancer, perhaps dementia. So the key is to restrict the amount of carbohydrates in proportion to how able your body is to cope with those carbohydrates. So I'm profoundly insulin resistant. I have type two diabetes. I may only eat 25 grams of carbohydrate per day or else I'm damaging myself and I will die with one of those five complications, any of them, if I eat too much carbohydrate. If on the other hand, you're moderately carbohydrate intolerant, you can have more carbohydrates or if you're completely, in, completely tolerant, which is like 5% of the population, then you can eat your carbohydrates. So the key is- And you'll to, be totally fine. And you'll be totally fine, but that's 5% of the population. Right. For the rest of us, at least 65, 70% of the population, we have to restrict the carbohydrates a little bit or a lot. So we've produced the book Real Meal Revolution. It has a green list. And the green list is all the real foods that are not processed. And as soon as a food becomes processed, they add sugar. And that, of course, increases your carbohydrate intake. So it's the real foods that come directly from the farm that's the foods we should be eating. When you say that, as you've said it now, I think that, that the world would say, well, that's where we're supposed to be going. But when you say that within the context of consumerism and, and manufacturing and you're talking about economy and all that kind of thing, those people will be saying, that's not where we should be going because of business interest. And perhaps that's something we can touch on down the line. I want to catch up with your journey. The last year, there's been a lot happening. Uh, we've been following the, the hearing. Uh, people have been saying things. I believe personally that it's been a good thing on the branding side, like I've mentioned. Has the interest in the so-called banting diet, I know that you said in the past it's not purely banting, uh, 
but uh, it's a huge component of painting. Do you believe the interest has increased? Uh, there's testimonials on the road, people are talking to me, people are talking to you. How's that been going? I think it's huge. I think the change has been dramatic. You know, two years ago, no one knew what the word banting meant. And so for the, the penetration has been dramatic. And we estimate between two to three million and South Africans. I thought it was an exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so. we, th we estimate that between two to three million people are banting. The book has sold 250,000 copies in South Africa. That's huge, it is especially massive. for the yeah. South African market. It's massive. And the book is now published overseas and it's selling pretty well, not as well as in this country, but nevertheless well. Now the impact has been huge and I think people just don't understand. There's a Banting Facebook in Cape Town, 170,000 members. Now you, you tell me another diet. There's no 170,000 members of the healthy, moderate diet. That, that doesn't have it because it doesn't work. Great. And that's the difference. So, so people are obviously saying that this worked. Uh, people that's on it says it's worked. People that are not sure about it are not sure about it, but they haven't tried it. But are you saying a big percentage of people that have tried it are saying that it works? Well, I, you know, I never get anyone write to me and say, your diet doesn't work. They say, well, I didn't comply to the diet and it didn't work. What's really interesting, on the front of cover of the Time, magazine, Time newspaper in London today, 120,000 diabetics in Britain signed up for a program in which they followed the Banting diet. They did not follow the conventional advice because they were fed up, because the conventional advice for diabetes doesn't work, it makes you sick. And they reported their results were absolutely astonishing. The majority improved on this, on the Banting type diet. And this is in complete contradiction to what the advice that they're given by the medical profession. So this is the revolt that is happening out there. And, and thank goodness for the social media and, and programs like this, that we can get the message out Great. that people really have to go on the internet and they have to follow people like myself and, and many other people who are promoting this diet. And then they can see, my gosh, people are getting better. Correct. Excuse pun, but you are going against the grain, <laughs> as we would say. Um, effectively, do you not think that that's the problem? Uh, is that not a human condition to have that problem? So this means that everyone is sort of used to a certain uh, philosophy and ideology and they're trained in a certain way. And there somebody comes along and says it was not that. The same thing happened when Galileo <laughs> made some discoveries. Yeah. People said that he needs to be executed. Yeah. Uh, but today we, we understand the world is round uh, <laughs> and, and not <laughs> flat. Uh, so, so timelessly we go through that in history and we, we just haven't learned, um, but we have learned in a certain way. Uh, what's your thought around all of that where we sort of stuck in this bubble? I know for you it might be frustrating. Yeah. And I'll tell you what the frustration is that you see, I'm trained as a scientist, although I'm a medical doctor and trained in medicine, I wanted to become a scientist and understand how science works and develop new ideas and promote new ideas. And in science, we promote conflicting ideas. We don't accept the truth, we try to disprove it. That's, that's the whole point. What frustrates me is that there is a complete suppression of the debate. So what happened to me was my own university tried to suppress my discussion. And then they said, oh, it's in the f we want free academic debate. Nonsense. They wanted to shut it down because the dean of medicine, as he was then, who's now moved on, said that my diet is dangerous. And he writes that in the Cape Times. Now, any medical student reading that says, gosh, I must never debate this. I can never open my mouth about this at the University of Cape Town Medical School because I'm going to fail my exams because the dean said it's dangerous. Please. And that closed down. So at the moment he opened his mouth, he shut down all debate. So, so this wasn't about, it wasn't about the pursuit for the truth. No, not at all. Uh, th this is something else. This means that there are other interests around all of this and that needs to be serviced first. Yes. And the point is, the medical profession is not going to change that until they're going to have to be forced to change it by the public. The public is going to have to say, we've had enough of this. We've read now the books and it shows that what the advice you're giving is wrong, it doesn't work. We want change. It's not going to come from inside. It's going to have to be forced from outside. You're making me think about one thing and that is we ultimately as human beings and as individuals, we are responsible for our own health. So whether we go to doctors or whether we go to anybody, we as people are responsible. And you're essentially saying that, guys, you need to wake up. You're responsible for what happens to you. Yeah. Uh, you maybe consult with a doctor, but if that doctor is not giving you the right advice, you, can, you cannot simply say, sit back and say, well, I spoke to the doctor and he said I can smoke. Yeah. 
Well, that's exactly what happened to me. See, I followed the advice that I was told by my professors of cardiology. 1977, I went on this high carbohydrate diet. And then 2010, I discovered I'm sick and I've got diabetes and I must change. And what was the problem? Family history, my father died of the disease and I'd eaten this high carbohydrate diet. If there'd been a Tim Noakes around in 1977 and said, no, 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 read the literature, don't change your diet, I would be fine. I wouldn't have type two diabetes. So I carry the burden. It's my fault, I made the choice. And, and what we're realizing is that there are two, the, the old medicine was the anointed, the power of the anointed. You went to the professor and the professor said, you will do this, you will do that, you will do the other thing, and you will come and see me in a week's time or a month's time. That's gone, that's history. Now we talk about the power of the crowds or the wisdom of the crowds. And each individual now is in charge. And the doctor is, is, is the consultant. We go along and we say, listen doc, this is my results, this is my blood sugars, this is what my insulin is doing, what do you, what do you think we should do? Mm. And then he'll say, gosh, that's really interesting looking at those data. I think together we should decide we should do these things. We can do this, we can do that, we can do the other thing. What do you think? The patient must control everything now, that's the key. And, and, and you can't come to your grave and say, gosh, I listened to these people and they, did, they gave me the wrong advice. I'm sorry. There's no recourse at that point. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's the beauty of the internet and social media. It's completely changed everything. Correct. Yes. So we have uh, basic issues going on where people are asking basic questions uh, in terms of, uh, for example, you talk a lot about meat, mm. uh, links between cancer and that sort of thing. Are there any evidences around all of those kind of things? That's a fantastic question and it shows why we got nutrition all wrong. The problem is if you want to prove that something causes cancer, you have to take a population of 40,000 people, you lock them up in a jail and you put 20,000 on one side and 20,000 on the other and you feed the one group meat and the other one you don't feed any meat. And 40 years later you, you let them out and you examine them and you see who got cancer. Great. It's impossible to do that. So what happened 30 years ago was the US government said, we can't afford those trials, we will do the second best type of trial. What we'll do is we'll look at those 40,000 people and we'll see who's eating meat today. And we'll follow them for 40 years and then we'll see what happens. So when you do that, when you take 40,000 people and you follow them for 40 years, at the end of the day, 6% will get colon cancer. And 6% will get, sorry, 5% of the people not eating meat will get colon cancer and 6% eating meat will get colon cancer. And then they said, well, you see, it's the 1% difference is caused by eating meat. The problem is, in that study, those 40,000 people or the 20,000 who are eating meat do many different things. They smoke more, they're less physically active, they do other things. And so there's a range of other variables that exactly, can affect that. Exactly right. So there'd be a, an odd causation of, of, the, of the research there. So, so let's, so absolutely. So it's very likely there was something else going on in that group. But the end result is that the difference was 1%, which means one case in 100. So even if meat was causing cancer, and we told the people, stop eating meat, the difference would be 6% would go down to 5%. We would save one person. The problem is when you take meat out of the diet, you replace it with something else. And you don't know what the effect of adding that other food in. For example, you eat grains. Now grains might cause other problems. They might cause diabetes, they might cause obesity, they might cause cancer, sorry, dementia, the, and all those things. And the end result is not, it's not what you die from, it's when you die. We all have to die from something. We're gonna have a heart attack, cancer, whatever. We all have to die. The question is when you die. And that's the question. And how you die. Exactly, and that, those meat studies, they don't look at mortality, when you die. They look at the incidence of cancer and they don't look at all the other conditions, you see. So, so effectively you are saying that you're not in agreement with the aspect that there's a direct link uh, or, or that there's, a, there's not substantive information to say that meat and cancer are linked in any way. No, not at all. So there is a possibility. What we next do is we have to do an intervention trial. We have to lock the people up in the jails if you want to prove causation. And those studies have never been done, they never will be done. And anyway, cancer is a carbohydrate driven disease. It is not driven by fat and protein. And therefore, it's very unlikely that meat is causing cancer. It's much more likely that it's preventing cancer. That's very interesting. Interesting dynamic, uh, which I really never thought about. <laughs> so we look at other aspects like uh, you are going through this trial, and I'm calling it the trial, yeah. uh, and a bit of a tribulation at the same time. <laughs> 
And, uh, but it's meant to be a hearing, but it has turned out to be a yes, trial. You're quite right. Watching it, it's been highly publicised. One, it sort of think that you committed murder the way some of the media yes, are portraying things, and I'm in disagreement with them personally. And and my message to media is that uh, if we do not know something, our cause is to find, like any other fraternity, what is happening before we make a judgment on that. And when someone puts down substantive evidence to say this is happening, then we need to look into that. And my message to media is that we need to act in the interest of the public before acting in the interest of corporate and all those kind of things. And I know the Pharmaceutical Council is probably looking at me right now <laughs> because the last time I asked the question to them, and that was, why would you solve my problem? Because it would shut your warehouse down. Exactly. And so they weren't too happy about <laughs> that one. But, but that's what it is. Effectively, you see a host of professionals, other doctors, um, people that are training different uh, medical uh, fraternities inside the fraternity itself what are they saying are they still standing on the divide I know that there's some that's sort of hardcore on the side and hardcore on that side are people crossing the floor slowly because people cross the floor on two things and that's they've you've either proven yourself one or two when the numbers get bigger on that side they politically move over <laughs> so, so so what's been happening there they're moving they're definitely moving I think that Many doctors are confused because this is not what they were taught and they need information. And we've decided to set up our own website to specifically to educate doctors and show them this is the evidence, follow it, and this is how you adapt it. Okay, so the information to them is sort of very, very scientific, where the information to the public is, is sort of what they yeah. understand. And you're saying you set up a website to doctors so that they understand the science of what you're talking That's about. That's correct. Because we feel they do need to see that. And once they see it, they'll change. What's happening now is patients are coming in and then saying, I lost 50 kilograms on the next diet and my diabetes is cured. And the doctor says, gosh, the, you know, again, it happens every day. Two days ago, a lady broke down and she cried on my shoulder. And she said, I'd lost 12 kilograms, I've, my diabetes medication gone, my hypertension medication gone. So I said, what did your doctor say? He said, well, if it works for you, that's great. Which, <laughs> which is fantastic, you see. Yeah, which is, he's getting there. He's getting there, exactly. Getting he might think, gosh, you know, maybe all my hypertensive patients might benefit from yes. this diet. But they'll get there. And I know that a lot of doctors have changed. So you're wishing for the day that the doctor like that would say, uh, I prescribe for you, let me just shut this down, a venting diet, yeah. <laughs> because and that would be... But that is going to come. Yes. And I think the medical students are also changing because they're much more media savvy. They're on Twitter and they follow me and they follow other people and they see yes. all the evidence which accumulates day to day. And I'm also watching your, your updates and retweeting yeah. them and yeah, you've probably been you. noticing that's been Indeed. going on. Indeed. Because I believe that um, society and the public is shackled in various in various realms and that's from an economic point of view from a health point of view and there's a group of people around all of that that controls all of those things and the minute you go against that uh, we have a problem as we see today how has this impacted on you in terms of your your personal life um, i know that you you're very family orientated you're retired and you're writing your books and things that we are going to see shortly how has it impacted on you well you know i have a very very strong family and they're 100 percent behind me and my wife is utterly astonishing and she has never let this get us down. So we've just got stronger. And I think we're now in such a strong position that, that when the trial, when the hearing ends, I think it's going to rule in our favor on everything. Because just to make the very, very simple point, on Twitter, that I'm accused of giving disgraceful advice and Especially so on. Especially to the, the, the baby and yeah. all of that. Yeah. But you see, the problem was, it was a we question. That's yeah. the, and I've been in the media for, for 40 years, yes. answering questions. And there are two types of questions. There's an I question. I have diabetes, what must I do? That's an I question, yes. and it's, that's more dangerous. But if it's a we question, tell me, Dr. Nox, there's so many diabetics in South Africa, what should they be doing? Yes. That's a we question, and I was asked a we question. And the rules for dietitians in South Africa, remember the dietitians brought the complaint against me. The rule says that if you're asked a we question in public, you may answer it without examining the patient. If you're asked an I question, you have to only answer it through, if a doctor has referred the patient, you may not answer it in public. Now that refers to dietitians. I think doctors are slightly different. But anyway, that is their ruling. So their own ruling did not allow them to bring the case against me. And so that it's going to fall down already on that. But I mean, there are a whole bunch of other things. Firstly, the lady never followed the advice. She said, she looked at it, and then two dietitians already told her that she, my advice was wrong. She said, well, gosh, I would never have followed that advice anyway. It's ridiculous. So this is a case where there's been absolutely no harm to anyone. 
But I suppose th there's a group of people waiting for that kind of thing to happen yeah. so that they can jump on this kind of thing and run with it and say, look what he's saying. And I well, suppose well, it I, part of that is... It started three years ago, and we now know the, how it was planned. And it was planned by important people in this country. For three years, they were trying to get me, to shut me up. That was the key. And publicly humiliate me. There were two things in it. Of course. Yeah. But you, you seem to have coped with that well. And um, I suppose that when one is standing in, in line of truth for anything, uh, there's another energy that goes by that. And uh, you know that this society and, and the world community needs to know what you're yeah, talking about. Exactly. They need to know the advice and they need to know the truth. Yeah. So if you're going to sit back and take a bit of pressure for that, that's fine. Exactly. exactly. It's about yeah, the truth in the end of the day. I'm not the only one. There's, there's a whole ground group of us throughout the world. I noticed on your Twitter there's a, a very sort of UK, USA yeah, right. uh, medical fraternity that's agreeing and retweeting yeah. what yeah. you're saying. How has it been going abroad? Very, very well. You know, we had the low carb conference in February in Cape Town last yes. year, and that group is very close knit. We have about 15 or 20 people, doctors around the world who are leading the campaign around the world. And this, a week ago, we produced a document in Britain that f in, on behalf of the National Obesity Forum. And it just said, the advice we're getting is completely wrong. These are the 10 things we have to do. And it's been, it caused a massive furor. It was on the front page of all the media in Britain. And the, the stodgy old people came out and said, oh, this, they're cherry picking the evidence and so on and so forth. And we could just say, well, actually, they're speaking on behalf of industry, each one of them. And you can't listen to people who's who are influenced by industry. And they, they, they never attack the question. They always attack us as individuals. And that shows the weakness of their case. That's interesting because um, I always say that we need to discern and we need to be able to, we need to, be able to separate matters. And that's, uh, for example, if we disagreed now about anything, we should have been able to, to sit and talk about it and have coffee afterwards. Exactly. But, but there, there tends to be a personal inclination when people feel that they are being defeated. Yeah. So let's go for the next best thing. And that's to character assassinate. Yeah. And I suppose that's what, well, exactly. what's going on there. Well, I was at a low carb conference last week in Iceland. And they, we invited, or they invited, one of the ladies who kind of has a different opinion. Although she also agrees with us, she doesn't agree on everything. And she was allowed to speak, and afterwards we chatted, and she said, oh, you know, I sit on the other side of the fence. I said, no, I said, that's fine. We want you to present that data. I said, I don't agree with you, and I think in time it'll prove wrong. But let's get out there and debate it. And w we didn't castigate her. She's part of the family. She's, a f she's out there, let her say what she wants to say. It's interesting. So. A basic question, someone like me, I'm trying to perhaps reduce that sugar and I have been doing that. My teas have changed, I, don't, I no longer take sugar and milk and those kind of things. Uh, I think you try some of my teas when you come <laughs> here. Lovely tea, yeah. Yeah, I thought that one was quite bitter, but <laughs> in any case. Um, so, so, so I would have five years ago, but since I haven't had sugar for five years, it doesn't, it's, it's, really it doesn't, years, it's fantastic. Yeah. So what happens, you, you go to, to some function which you sort of invited all the time, and the way that, that people present cakes and, and, and chocolates, they always look divine. Yeah. Can one have a little bit? <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping for that. Yeah, it depends how bad your sugar addiction is. So you, remember, you must remember that sugar is as addictive as cocaine and heroin. And we don't recognize that because it's a freely available drug which we give to our children every day. And we have to understand. A freely available drug. I hope you guys heard that. People have to understand that. Yes. It acts on the same parts of the brain. It's equally. Yes, I get that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, if you are not addicted, like my wife can eat one square of chocolate, and that's it. I can't. She doesn't need to go back to the dealer. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I can't. I'll finish the whole block. And if I, if I were to. I, <laughs> so, I, need to I need to live next to the dealer. It's, it's there. Right. It's there. So uh, I cut all sugar five, six years ago, actually, not six years. And I haven't had any sugar in six years. And, and I, when I look at something, I, I just, I wouldn't even think about it. It's disgusting to me. I wouldn't want to touch it. I mean, uh, and that, so what you said is attractive to me. It's disgusting. No, I can imagine. <laughs> so they say it's in the eye of the builder. But, but you know, the interesting thing, Professor, is that when I'm in Cape Town, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, and my business partner is going to, he's probably going to rattle my cage for this. So I go and stay with him and they live on sugar. In actual fact, there's a sugar truck parked against their home <laughs> and they just, they just pack it out from there all day long. Everything is sugar. For some reason, when I'm there in Durban, I suddenly, in two or three days' time, build up that attraction again. Right. So I start going for one or two cakes 
and then it's three, four, and then I've got to have it. By the time I get to Cape Town, I need to go for rehab again. Does it happen that quick? That's typically, absolutely. One conversion to one, really quick. one, one yeah. thing of sugar is enough to convert you. It's like cigarettes. Yes. You know, someone can stop smoking and they have one cigarette, they're gone. And the same with alcoholics, one drink and you're gone. Yeah, well, and that is how powerful it is. And so what's happening is you're going back to the environment that you feel comfortable when you're eating sugar. And that's it. You have to avoid that. Like you can't send an alcoholic to a pub. That's it. Because you've got to stay away from <laughs> the, the pub. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. The same and when you're in Cape Town, you've kind of, you've withdrawn from it. Yes. And you've got a different behavior. Yes. And so that's what keeps you. I'm currently in here. I came yeah, from there a couple of days yeah. ago. <laughs> so it's going well. Professor, um, I know that uh, down the line, people have been bombarding me for the last year. They've, um, they're coming up to me at events and, and, and I sometimes am scared because they ask me, what did you say about that? And so I've become a bit of an advocate for you um, where I'm saying, but, but go to the YouTube uh, channel, watch that episode or come and collect yeah. a copy of it, you know, that sort of thing, just to help them along. I felt that we could help people a bit more. And um, I therefore propose to you, which you, you seem very interested in. And I maybe want to announce that to viewers that uh, we are planning to go out there uh, do something live in, in the public space where we can chat for, for 15, 20 minutes and get the public to ask those questions directly to you. Do you think that would benefit them? I absolutely think so. I mean, I think a lot of the people who come will be converted already, but we want the people who aren't converted. We want them to come and hear us speak. It might be emulsified already. <laughs> <laughs> and once they see the evidence, it's, it's so overwhelming that we can convince them. You know, when the Real Meal Revolution came out, I've, sp I've spoken, given 120 lectures on the topic to over 30,000 South Africans. I know what the people want and the questions they're asking and, and why would there have been so much interest? No doctor in South Africa, no dietitian in the history of South African medicine has spoken so often to the public on a topic. And you have to ask why, because it's so interesting to people. Correct, yes. Uh, going forward, um, I know that if we look at other nations like the USA, for example, I think it's common knowledge that people have become more obese over time. Well, what's the trend in South Africa at the moment? Well, we're getting more obese and we will yeah. until we reverse the diets. So that's, we have to change the food environment. It's the food environment. You see, what, what governments do and what politicians do is they say, you see, it's your fault that you're getting fat. We know that if you follow this advice, you won't get fat. And that's nonsense. It's the food environment. You cannot be thin in this food environment unless you're just genetically fortunate. You will become sugar addicted and you will overeat the calories. And that's the key. So what happens is we have a controller in the brain that determines how many calories we eat. And it's been hijacked by the, the foods that we're eating. They've been designed specifically to addict us. So we eat these addictive foods and we get fat and then the diabetes appears and the cancer and the dementias. And so you have to change the food environment. And that, that's difficult because there's a lot of money involved in that. Great. Uh, you, you speak about that change, and I, I think that's the big thing for, for people and members of the public. It's about that change. It's about crossing that bridge to say that I want to effect that change and to get them to that point. And many people say, but I, and I think that some people disagree because they don't want to be part of that change or they don't see things changing. For those that have changed, you're saying that there has been major results. Uh, is there perhaps a line in between where people can transition in stages? So we look at the Real Meal Revolution and, and it's become a Bible to some people to say that you need to follow tenant number one and two and this is the fifth commandment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you don't, that will happen kind of thing. But is there a transitionary phase for people that say, can I move slowly across? Because that's human nature. Yeah. Let me say that what we realize now is the real meal revolution hit the higher socioeconomic classes, so they got it all. Uh, or at least they've got the evidence and they can go on the internet. Please. For the poorer communities, we started the Eat Better South Africa campaign. I, had a, I have a foundation, the Noakes Foundation, and we funded eight interventions in eight communities around the Western Cape. The last program was in Atlantis. And we go in there and we say, this is the food you need to eat, and it's not expensive. And we know that you can eat at the same cost that you're now spending on your foods, you can eat banting foods. And the results have been dramatic. You know, we just, we reverse hypertension. High blood pressure just drops. Immediately you take the sugar and excessive carbohydrates out of the diet. And so within six weeks, we can reverse the hypertension in so many people. And now they start to realize, my gosh, I don't have to go to Kruderskir Hospital every month and spend a day there and get my, what they call a party pack. Mm -hmm. 
for treating a condition that's not it might help keep my blood pressure down but in the long term it's not really helping me because I still have to go there I have to spend the money to get there I have to take a day out of work if I don't have to if my blood pressure is normal I don't even have med medication I don't have to do that the, the, the economic benefits are huge and what I realized looking at these poor communities is that we are spending so much money on the on the pharmacological management of the diseases that are being caused by bad diets and so we're robbing those communities of income and finances if we would just get the diet right then that money which is now not going to pay for drugs which don't really make a difference we could then put that back in the community and that's that's the message we're trying to get out I normally ask this last question on the flip side but I'm going to flip the question <laughs> I normally ask I would have normally asked you the people that support you what's your message to them but I'm not gonna I'm yeah. not gonna because your message to them I know what that's gonna be and they probably they, they, they got the benefits of what what yeah. they've decided but what's your message to people that are still saying this man is talking nonsense well I would say let's go let me talk to you let me show you the evidence and read it the scientific evidence is absolutely clear in 1977 when we changed our diet with the obesity diabetes epidemic began we now have a bunch of randomized controlled trials we have 44 trials showing that this diet outperforms the conventional diet for the reversal of obesity. We now know that heart disease is caused by abnormalities in the liver on the basis of a high carbohydrate diet. So what happens, you eat a high carbohydrate diet and you're insulin resistant, you store fat in the liver. The fatty liver then starts to churn out the long, wrong types of cholesterol and that then damages your arteries. So what we used to say is the diet heart hypothesis, eating fat in the diet causes heart disease is not. It's the diet liver heart hypothesis. And the liver disease is caused by carbohydrates. So we can now reverse and say, okay guys, we got it completely wrong. It wasn't the fat that was killing us, it was the carbohydrate. And that evidence is abundantly clear now. It will only become apparent and taught in five to 10 years time. But every person got to ask the question, you know, are you lean? Are you insulin sensitive? Fine, eat what you like. If you're not, you better find out. Because I can tell you, if you come to my age at 60 and you just, well, I'm now 66, but discover at 60 you've got diabetes, which you never had to have. With an insulin roll, as you call it. That's right. Yeah. You didn't have to have that. Mm -hmm. If you just change your diet. And one of the great successes of the Real Meal Revolution was we said, it's not your fault. It's the food choices. And if you just change the food choices, you'll be fine. I think that's an interesting, uh, I think that's something for everyone to think about. And uh, I think that if people think that they are going to sit in a group and, and bang you for what, what, what's happening, yeah. they need to understand that what you're saying affects them individually and it's going to be an individual choice in the end of the day. Professor Tim, it's been nice having you. I want to continue catching up with you because I know that after this one, there'll be more and more questions, but I'm happy to <laughs> see. And I didn't want to bother you in the last couple of months because I've been just watching the press and, and seeing that you're going through all of that. But it doesn't seem to have phased you at all. No, the truth will remain the no, truth, I suppose. Yeah. And, and it's about that. Yeah, exactly. And that I'm so proud to have been able to, to lead the charge in South Africa. I know after my death, people will say, but why did we ever think the opposite? So that's fine. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm You've chosen where you want that statue of yours to be. <laughs> outside UCT, perhaps. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Tim, it's been nice having you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Faisal. Professor Tim notes again, going against the grain, uh, I remember at one point he said it was about challenging beliefs and I think it's all about that. He seems to have made it very well on the other side of the hearing. Many people have been asking me that question, what's happening, has he made it out? Uh, that sort of thing, I think he has made it out. Uh, it's The question now is, will you make it out? Until next time, goodbye.